class today is supposed to have been strategic ideas and just uh, the idea I had prepared and I um, a, a lecture about uh, outposts in the center it's a really really good one it's a pity that I won't be delivering it <laughs> instead I got as usual sidetracked by events that are happening around the world uh, what's happening is there's a major event going on in Thessaloniki in Greece and uh, today um, uh, Gata Kamsky, the U.S. champion of 2013, played against Hikaru Nakamura, is black, the 2012 U.S. champion. And when these two guys meet, you know, well, you know, this beautiful idea of a strategic lecture, well, that just <laughs> went right out the window. And I spent my morning uh, watching this game unfold and it is a fantastic game and uh, uh, a qu uh, quick story there is that before the US championship Kamsky had come from Souk, Switzerland. He arrived literally jet lag, completely gone, uh, barely made the opening ceremony, was half asleep and then he won the U.S. Championship with a 4-0 start. Oh, yeah, I think it was a 4-0 start, followed by five draws. Yeah he, was lucky. Uh, yeah, he was lucky. He goes from the U.S. Championship immediately to New York to say hello to his folks there. Then he goes to Moscow, his home, changes his suitcase, goes to Thessaloniki, Greece, where he, st did he start with a win, Ben? Gotta, I have an impression. He, well, yeah, exactly. I, I believe it was round one, but then he goes on to where he is today, which is in first place in Thessaloniki. It's like, how does he do it? I'm just amazed because uh, jet lag plays havoc with my system, and I've traveled all over the world, and despite 35 years of great experience uh, dealing with jet, jet lag, I've never managed. <laughs> I mean, I always get nailed. It's just really, like really, 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 really bad. And uh, well, here he is playing a very uh, crucial matchup, not only for the tournament, but just in terms of the rivalry that these two players have between themselves. It's very clear that they stand number one and number two. The thing that's always been in dispute is, who's number one and who's number two. Well, of the last few years, we have to give the edge to Hikaru, not only because of his extraordinary rating in the world of chess, but just uh, what he's managed to accomplish, and most especially in 2012, in the very last round, uh, Hikaru needing to win with the black pieces did precisely that uh, in penultimate round, pardon me, and defeated Gata and went on to clinch in the U.S. Championship. Gata, however, he stuck to his guns. In, in 2012, he played E4 and lost uh, in a very uh, straightforward way uh, to um, a Sicilian. Uh, in this game, uh, Hikaru very, well, not very surprisingly, but surprising to myself, played E6. I think in this particular round, there was something like whew, five games with E5, like E4, E5, just dominated today's round, and lots of Rui Lopez's by white players. The French defense was played, D4, D5, Knight, D2, uh, the Tarash defense. I loved playing the French defense as a kid, and I, I, I especially liked to play n against the knight c3, the winner were variation. And it always bugged me, uh, as, and af after e5, c5, or actually my favorite move was knight e7 here, and after a3, I was very cagey 
with the black pieces and I would play for b6 and bishop a6. Um, but I, it always annoyed me when my opponents played knight d2. I didn't have a really you know, good answer for knight d2. Yes. Did you object to b3 with the knight? Is that the idea behind d2? No. Well, the idea behind knight d2 is as simple as white is defending the pawn on e4, and he's looking to avoid the bishop b4 pin because he simply has c3. So the idea is simply to avoid bishop b4. Now, the, uh, when my opponents played knight d2 against me, and I would go with with the straightforward variation. The line that I didn't like with black is that my opponents would build up uh, what we call the big center or the center clamp. You know, white has this very nice chain of pawns all the way to e5 and black's knight, if he doesn't manage to solve the problem with the knight on d7, uh, black can get into trouble early. Uh, a favorite move of mine in this position was I used to play rook b8. The idea was several fold. First of all, I was very anxious, perhaps more anxious than I needed to be uh, as black. I wanted to solve this bishop on c8. And the idea of, b, of rook b8 was that after my opponents played bishop d3, I would play b5. They would play knight e2, I would play b4. They would probably play something like castles, and I would play moves like queen b6 here. And my aim is to, well, besides, you know, a good demonstration of yeah, activity on the queen side, uh, frankly speaking, I was playing for bishop a6. But again, my, my results weren't that great with black, and knight d2 was a very big problem for me. And it wasn't only my problem. It was a problem of Viktor Korchnoi. And in 1974, Viktor Korchnoi played a match for the candidates' final. It was a 24-game match against Anatoly Karpov. And Anatoly Karpov, in those days, his repertoire was specifically knight d2. And Korchnoi would play c5, e takes d5, e takes d5, knight here, knight c6, bishop b5. And he'd end up defending uh, some ending like this, which I'm about to show you, uh, an isolated queen pawn kind of position. And uh, Basically, Karpov tortured him. Uh, Korchnoi achieved a lot, a lot of draws, but he had a hell of a time with black uh, in this isolated queen pawn middle game, endgame that often uh, came out of this opening. So in those days, this, this match in 1974 was played in the Soviet Union. And Anatoly Karpov, was the Soviet Chess Federation's choice in the upcoming contest against Bobby Fischer. So Anatoly Karpov had a huge retinue of chess grandmasters that were supporting him. And Viktor Korchnoi's help was essentially Yasha Murray, a grandmaster who now lives in Israel. And uh, Yasha Murray said, um, to Korchnoi that this, this line with c5, that this ending that, that Korchnoi was getting was very uncomfortable and, and he had a bishop move on move three for, uh, for Korchnoi to play. And that same evening, uh, Korchnoi re uh, received a call from Grandmaster Roman Jinji Hashvili who was secretly helping Viktor Korchnoi because Roman, uh, Roman didn't want to get into trouble with the Soviet authorities by openly helping Korchnoi. And Roman said, Viktor, I've got a great idea for you on move three. Move your bishop. He says, yes, yes, yes. Murray told me. 
I should play bishop d7 with the idea of going into the Fort Knox variation after takes, takes, knight takes, bishop c6, bishop d3. Yasha wants me to play this ending, th th this middle game with knight d7 and followed by bishop e7 and knight f6. <laughs> no, 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 says Roman Jinjirishvili, not bishop d7, bishop e7. <laughs> That's the move that you want to play, bishop e7. Well, I adopted this move many years ago, bishop e7, because I really liked it. It somehow, in this moment, the, the lines c5, takes, takes, uh, didn't appeal to me. The line a6, followed by c5, takes, takes, those didn't appeal to me either. Uh, sorry, let me just put that on the board. So a6 is, a, is considered a normal move knight f3, c5, and so what's the big difference? Well, the big difference is, is that white's bishop f1 doesn't get to go to this nice square b5, and after, for example, a line like bishop e2, knight c6, castles, <coughs> the bishop isn't that well placed on e2. Even there's a line where black plays c5, c4, if he is afraid of the isolated queen pawn position. Okay. Uh, sorry, what did did I do something wrong? No, uh, just in a few minutes. Uh, sorry, here, let me just get on my glasses. So that's a6. That was the line with a6, correct? Yeah. Knight gf3. Uh, sorry, c5 takes, takes, bishop e2. Knight c6, castles. Yeah, so uh, yeah. uh, th this, is, this is a very common sequence that after knight b3, thanks to the queen, uh, black, uh, white will recapture the pawn on d4. And, well, it's just a, a line of play. And again, I personally don't like this line very much for black. And so I was seeking answers to knight d2, and I like the move bishop e7, because in a, in a very strange way, <coughs> the line with knight f6, e5, knight d7, f4, kind of plays into white's hands. So the idea of bishop e7 makes really a lot of sense. Like, okay, it's your turn with white, what are you going to do? Uh, if you play a move, for example, like e5 here, first of all, it's not coming with the tempo, and then after c5, c3, knight comes out quickly and queen comes to b6 quickly, and white is a little bit wrong-footed. If, if white plays this move, c2, c3, which is what black is actually trying to induce, well, one idea is that now that white has committed, excuse me, white has committed himself to playing c3 before I play c5, well, my idea as black was to go into the Rubenstein French variation, which is this, where I've included the move bishop e7, and white has very kindly included the move c3. Okay. It's not like that everybody who plays the French defense wants to take on e4, and that was not uh, uh, Hikaru's choice. He played c5, and now this strange move e5 was played. Okay, uh, strange move, normal move. It's kind of like an advanced French where black has played bishop e7, a little bit iffy, not the greatest move. But on the other hand, in an advanced French, it's not very common for white to put his knight on d2 so early. So I thought that black is doing quite OK. Uh, knight g f3, and now this cute little move, bishop d3. Essentially, in the opening, it's a constant fight as both players are trying to find harmony for their pieces. So uh, before this move, knight c6, so very rudely uh, interrupts white's flow, 
White has got to imagine what would be an ideal setup for his pieces. Well, if he, if he had his druthers and black didn't bother him, he'd like to play bishop d3, he'd like to play this knight to e2, he'd like to castle, and he'd like to put this knight on f3. Then this, the pawn on d4 would be very, very well protected, and black would simply suffer a cramp in the center. Okay, so black's idea is as straightforward as it can be, which is not to allow white to harmonize his pieces as I've just showed. Bishop d3, bishop, knight c6, bishop d3. Okay, so now a, uh, uh, takes on d4, takes on d4, and a crucial position has been reached. You very much, if you were black, you'd be elated to capture this pawn on d4. The problem with knight takes d4 is simply that after queen g4, it's simply too good. Uh, white's threat of queen g7 or queen d4 essentially is winning for white. Hence, we see knight h6, knight f3, and now this very double-edged risky move by Hikaru. In this position, which has been reached before several times, I should say, uh, knight f5 has been the standard way of playing it, this kind of uh, uh, way of play for black is very standard. Uh, obviously, you're still not threatening to capture on d4 lots of times because in the end there's a check, a discover check, and you lose your queen. And very often, a move like g4, black is ready to meet this move with knight to h4. Okay, in this position, queen b6, Let's say, let me just put in another move for a moment, castles, and let's say bishop d7. So again, now at long last, black is ready for a lot of grabbing on the d4 square. White could grab this knight on f5, and you get a position like this. And this is very, very debatable. After a move, for example, like knight f4, the debate is, this bishop is ugly. It's a big, bad bishop. It, uh, it's the bad, 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 bad bishop, the bishop that we all like to avoid. But uh, Grandmaster uh, from Romania, uh, had, well, I'll remember his name in a moment, had this wonderful, wonderful quote, bad bishops defend good pawns. <laughs> 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 These are good pawns. These pawns on d5 and f5 are very good. Like Michael Shuba. Like yeah, and he did. He, bad bishops defend good pawns. And even though this bishop looks bad, in Black's mind, he could castle and one day play ideas like h6 and g5 and force that knight to capture that bad bishop. But that was not something that uh, Hikaru was interested in, and instead he played the move f7, f6, very, very risky, double-edged, which it suits Hikaru, uh, and he basically said, I invite you to capture my knight on h6 and double my pawns. And Gada said, thank you very much, I'll do that. Takes knight e2. Now, what do we have going on here? Well, <coughs> in reality, the position is extraordinarily sharp. Black has these horrible, horrible pawns on h6 and h7, but he's got some other pluses in the position. The first and most important is that black has the two bishops. If black could ever, in a fantasy, capture this pawn on e5, force black, white, pardon me, to recapture this pawn on e5 with the pawn, it's a very good chance that this pawn can be won. How? Well, you could play your rook to f8, and you could sacrifice your rook as one. Another is you might play queen to c7 and simply take the pawn. The one really bad thing about black's position is that 
these pawns being really a poor shield, it, it usually means that <laughs> black's king is going queenside. So if black could play moves like queen b6, bishop d7, castles long, he might be able to turn the fact that this pawn is terrible on h6 into an, ad an advantage, a potential attack down the g-file. So, in short, the position is still full of mystery. I don't know. Queen b6, and here's start number one of the mystery. Uh, I think it would have been better for black to play check. Uh, just check. Uh, if white plays queen to d2, besides the fact that I could consider the move bishop b4, which is probably very good, uh, after queen d2, I'm happy to go into an ending. Uh, after the trade of queens, queen takes d2, say king takes d2, this pa these pawns are not that vulnerable, and after bishop d7 and castles, I think black is doing well. I'm pretty sure that Gada would have played king f1. He's played these types of ideas with white very often in his career, and his problem with his king on f1 is that his rook on h1 but, uh, is in trouble, but Gada usually solves this by playing h4, rook h3, and so on. But I do think that queen a5 check was the best move. Yeah, sir. Yes. Why not the knight to c3 to block? Knight to c3 is a good, is, it's a very good move as well. And, later. and uh, yes, exactly. And you can worry about castling later and things like that. The idea goes back to the question that I started with, which is really about peace harmony. In a sense, the knight on c3 is okay, it's not that great. When white's knight was on e2, what white's ambitions were involved was maybe to play knight f4 and to really go after this pawn on e6. The problem is, is that the knight on c3, for example, after say bishop d7, let's just put some moves on the board for just a moment, castles, castles, uh, we get a position Probably it's in white's favor still, but it's, again, doubled, double-edged, edged, double-edged, double yeah, that's all right. Yeah, double-edged, that's it. And uh, I don't know. Uh, I have enough experience with the French to say that uh, it's not all display on one goal. There's a lot, there's a lot that's going to ha happen over the next few moves. White, of course, is going to go a3, b4. Black is going to move his king. He's going to move his rook. His queen, which isn't great on the queen side, is probably going to come back to d8 or maybe c7. Yes, Depends. Yes. Follow up, though. From c3, you yeah. could hop easily to a nest on e6 via b5. Yes. So once you start with c3, you've got the option of retreating into the plan of the pawn attack, but you also have the option of going to uh, forward to final nest of d6. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, I, I, I totally agree that oftentimes in the French defense, thanks to this pawn on e5, the d6 square is kind of like a magnet for white's pieces, like you really like to put a knight on d6. But as we saw, I mean, okay, black took this horrible obligation of these pawns, but he got this dark squared bishop in return. Yeah, well, again, it's with the king on the queen side, uh, B black is hoping that he might be able to use the opportunity of, of the half-open g-file to try to provoke white. And again, in a dream world, just fantasy dream, if you could, as black, if you could force the exchange of f6 for the d4 pawn, there's even ideas of bishop e8, bishop g6 as well as bishop h5. In short, I'm saying it's a double-edged position and I did like queen a5 as opposed to Hikaru's choice, queen b6, castles. Because now, <coughs> I don't know if Hikaru thought seriously that his, with the queen on b6, what's the idea of the queen on b6? Well, it's got two <laughs> ideas, principally. 
The first is to capture the pawn on d4. Well, that's not happening. You are not capturing the pawn on d4 because it's defended uh, too many times. Knight on e2, knight on f3, queen on d1. And the second idea of queen on b6, oh, capture this one. If you don't, don't give me the, the uh, d4 pawn, I'll take the b2 pawn. So here, I don't, uh, uh, Hikaru played the move bishop d7. And I'm pretty sure he didn't seriously consider the move queen takes b2, but I'm an old pawn grubber. <laughs> I would have seriously considered, I mean, you know, if you, did, if you play queen b6, well, you know, your, your, your idea and intention is to follow up with queen takes b2. The problem is, after queen takes b2, let's just put a move on the board, rook b1, for a moment, and let's just go all in whole hog, as we'd say, uh, queen takes a2. Well, here, uh, the problem as I see it is black's king. Now that the b file is open, you're probably not playing bishop d7 and allowing rook takes b7. How about rather than playing uh, rook d1 immediately, yeah. you play queen a4 first, and then rook d1? Uh, that's, a, that's a thought. Let me just finish what I, oops. <laughs> Queen b2, let me just finish. So we get here, and you're not playing bishop d7. Well, if you're not playing bishop d7, what are you doing with your king? And that's a darn good question. After the move queen c1, we, we see instantly the drawback be behind these double pawns. As I see it, white has sacrificed two pawns, but he's absolutely going to get back this one. Oops. How come I can't draw arrows? Huh, I don't know why I can't draw arrows. Okay, but he's absolutely going to play queen takes h6. Queen g7 is a, is a follow-up idea. You might want to try to shut things down, but it's not going to be that easy. And I don't think you want to play knight b4 and allow moves like bishop b5 check. So I think that this would have been an extremely risky pawn grab, and I like pawn grabbing. So that, that was a bit too much. Uh, the gentleman suggested another concept. Queen takes b2, queen uh, a4. OK, the keep in mind that uh, as a French defense player, I really, really like trading queens. <laughs> I mean, uh, as black, I want to get the queens off. I feel that uh, I really reduce white's attacking power uh, tremendously by trading queens. It's something I really aspire for in the French. So after a move like queen a4, uh, one instinctive move would be queen b4. Another instinctive move would be queen a3. Queen a3 I kind of like simply to get out of this stuff over here. And if, if you take bishop takes, and if you take here, I'll be pretty happy with that. I think I can deal with that either with king and king, or maybe just simply castles. Can you play queen c2 yeah, queen c2. Pardon me? Queen c2, knight b4 is already starting to be a little bit tricky. I don't think I'd go for knight b4 right away. I'm not ha I I'd be very happy to lose this pawn on h7. So, for example, bishop d7, I'd be very uh, pleased that you spent so much time grabbing this pawn on h7 and maybe putting your pieces a little bit away from black's king. Escape. It seemed like a safer way to play. You're, you're, only down one, you're only down one pawn, you got your pawn. Right? Yeah, and that's very interesting. Uh, when you play against the French defense and your opponent is playing very provocative, uh, the move knight h6 is a very provocative move. I think at that moment, after bishop takes h6 and gh, there's no safety anymore. I think you, st you have to stop thinking like, oh, I want to grind him out or something like that. Uh, I think you just go whole hog. Like queen takes b2, you go rook b1, queen takes a2, and you're just very, very happy that the, that the game is a mess.
<laughs> you know. And keep in mind, you know, the mass is that really this king uh, is not safe. It's not safe. It, it, it's kind of a tough life, uh, the, the life of the, the, uh, the black king in a French defense. It's not really that safe on the king's side, and it oftentimes <laughs> isn't that safe in the queen's side, and it oftentimes isn't safe in the center. Uh, when the French king really starts to like uh, the situation is when the queens are off and it's getting more towards an end game as opposed to a middle game. Okay, so far so good. Everything's normal. Bishop d7. And now, you know, in the good old days, uh, when I was thinking of myself as, you know, growing up as a kid, uh, this position, well, you know, I, I know what I do in an instant here. Um, as a, a class player, I would probably play the move rook b1, yeah? As an expert master player, I would play a3, and I congratulate myself on my understanding, yeah? <laughs> the idea of a3 is, you know, I of course want to play the move b4 and, you know, grab some space and since this guy's a weakness, um, you know, I turn a, a weakness into a strength because I'd be wanting to play b4 and b5 and drive this knight away. So, you know, as a class player I'd play rook b1 and as an expert master I'd play a3. But as a world class grandmaster, B4, whoa, this move really, you know, gets like 12 stars, you know, like, whoa, you know, you're just not supposed to be able to do that, you know, because there are three, count them, black pieces that can take this pawn, and white is basically saying, please do me a favor, take my pawn on B4. Interestingly enough, um, uh, he, um, Hikaru declined, declined the opportunity to take the pawn on, on b4. First of all, how many of you would have considered the move b4? <laughs> yeah, baby, you know, like, okay. It didn't, I, it, I mean, I think in some very, very vague recesses of my consciousness I may have considered it, but really, I mean, it, it's sort of like what I was saying is like A3 became my sophisticated kind of move just because I thought, okay, queen takes B2, rook B1, queen takes A3, rook takes B7, let's get it on. Let's go, let's go crazy. Uh, after A3, no idea. <laughs> no idea. Probably, he should probably cons play as he did in the game, which was maybe castles, uh, b4, or king b8, something like that, is maybe how black has to walk into this attack. And again, I have convinced myself that a3 and b4 were very good. Yes. Exactly. So rook b1, again, the class move would play rook b1 for all of the reasons, not least of which is, by the way, uh, ideas such as b4, and then you cannot capture because a3, well, you just win material. Uh, one thing that you have to be a little bit uh, um, leery of or wary of, how I'm not exactly sure how to put that, is in some cases, perhaps not directly here, there's this move knight b4, which is a kind of an annoying move. Black essentially wants to solve the problem of his d7 bishop. He simply wants to take, take, and play bishop to b5. Okay, so uh, not that knight b4 uh, is necessarily the best move for black, uh, in response to rook b1, but that's something to be considered, and that's why I personally like the move a3. You cut out knight b4, and you're ready for b4. But there's no question that this move b4 is actually the strongest move. And here, Hikaru played a6, 
and the game continued. Can you tell us what happens if Vlad does take that point? That, uh, that was what I wanted to ask you guys. You know, like, hey, I mean, you know, my, my question is, is like, why didn't Black capture the pawn? Well, first we can deal with queen takes b4. We just discard that almost instantly as thank you very, very, very much. You've just allowed White's rook into the heart of Black's camp and you've made it impossible for Black to castle long and it's terrible. <laughs> so if queen takes b4, we can reject. Bishop takes b4, we could probably reject for, you know, another reason, kind of pedantic, but there it is, is, well, after captures on f6, I just don't like this position one bit for black. Uh, essentially, rook b1, knight e5, this pawn is pretty darn good on f6, and after all, that's a huge outpost. So I don't like trading the b2 pawn for the f6 pawn. How about instead knight takes b4? Okay, so knight takes b4, that certainly uh, is worth considering. And a moment ago I had mentioned that knight b4 to try to take this bishop uh, works out very well for black. So let's imagine rook to b1, uh, <coughs> pinning the knight to the queen. Let's imagine that a2, a3 is a real threat. And so queen a5 getting off the, um, the pin. But unfortunately, from black's point of view, queen d2. Uh, queen, queen c7 instead of queen a5. Uh, uh, come to that in a moment. What? It does to me, too. We'll see, we'll see why in a moment. But queen d2. This just looks, first of all, I'm threatening to capture on f6, winning back my pawn. I love doing that. Um, and you still haven't solved very well, at least this. You could go back with your knight, but then I'm going to take the pawn on h6, and my rook on b1 is very good. Let's go back a second. Pardon me. Queen a, uh, not queen a5, but we, uh, queen c7 was a suggestion. Queen c7. The problem, as I see it, is again, is that white is simply ready to capture this pawn on f6. And uh, that, 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 that bishop tempo just, uh, you know, like it was really like an uh, move. Yeah, removing the guard. Okay. B4. Knight takes b4 here, uh, here. rook here. Yeah, the and then, uh, yeah, this is a variation. Yes, and now retreat the knight. Yeah, and then he said he could capture the f pawn, but then black just recapture with the bishop in that position, can't No, I think I'm going to capture here. Sorry, I beg oh, your pardon. Okay. Queen takes h6. Now, in this position, besides threatening to capture on f6, another problem that you should be very aware of is bishop check, rook takes b7. In other words, white's having a lot of fun <laughs> here. Yeah. He hasn't sacrificed that much uh, in terms of the goods, uh, the goodies, and black's king is uh, facing all kinds of threats. I'm absolutely sure Hikaru didn't want anything to do with these variations, but the problem from Hikaru's point of view is this move b5 is really a you know a pain and, and you know painful move to have to uh, address he played a6 which i think was fine and then here again you know you have this safety play if you like you know this idea that you know you haven't burned any bridges why not just play a, a nice little safe move like a2, a3, you know? You, you expanded nicely on the queen side. Black's king is not going to be very happy if he goes long after moves like queen d2 and rook b1 and b5. 
I'm very happy to ha that this pawn on a6 is a target. So, you know, white could play a move like a3 and just simply keep the position, right? But this is a, again, this is a kind of a situation where white should not be thinking in such terms, but rather thinking, you know, he's got to go full out and just absolutely try to refute black's entire play. Queen d2, very nice move, takes on e5, takes on e5. In a sense, you know, the, uh, how do you say, the ante is getting higher. Okay, after this trade of e5, which black has been wanting to do for quite some time, remember how this pawn on f6 was this constant, you know, you had to, you know, there was a knight on b4 that after e takes f6, somehow there's a, there's a tempo. Well, black is now very happy. He solved that problem that he, he now no longer has to worry about e takes f6 constantly uh, above him. But on the other hand, something else that's even more uh, insidious has appeared, and that is the square d4. From a strategic point of view, it would really be dreadful for, for black to allow white or to let white establish a knight on d4. A knight on d4 with this pawn on b4, this knight would be, invul would be invulnerable. Uh, I understand right now the queen is uh, um, covering the square d4, but just from a strategic point of view, if white could ever play knight on e two to d4, he'd have this incredibly powerful knight in the middle of the board, and this bishop on d7 really genuinely sucks. Well, he would take it twice. Bishop g6 wins the queen. That's, a, that's, that's the, uh, well, we're assuming black makes some move here, you know, but I'm just saying that knight d4 is a uh, a scary strategic threat that black is facing, and he, and he has to do something about that. Well, Hikaru, uh, he's a, he's a res resourceful rascal. I, can t I, I give him a great deal of credit for that. Uh, here he came up with queen takes b4, queen takes h6, queen a3, and that move I didn't like. Queen a3. Uh, I thought that uh, the whole fight now has to shift. And the new battleground, at least from Black's point of view, the theater that he wants to create as the battleground is the king side. And here, I just didn't like the move queen a3 because, frankly speaking, that isn't the battleground. What's going on over here? I thought that, oops, excuse me, I thought the crucial move here from Black's point of view was Queen G4. Okay. So the idea of Queen G4, first and foremost, I don't like my king getting checked, right? Like Bishop G6, I, I, I don't want to have to deal with ideas like Queen G7 either. I'm mean, not, not really happy about those F7 things. Queen G7 is really nasty for black and group of white. Queen, yeah. Queen, I mean, the king, the king all kinds of uh, nasty things. So first of all, Queen G4. Now, I'm not saying this is a good move or a bad move. It is a move. And I can imagine a lot of players wanting to play h3 and just drive the queen back. And I was just thinking that after this move, queen g8, again, black's position isn't that great, but at least, uh, you know, if I were black in this position, I'd give myself a shout. I would be thinking, well, I've protected e6, my queen okay, it's a little half-assed at the moment, but the, it is on the file. I'm dreaming. I'm dreaming of castling long, and I'm dreaming that I'll be able to play castles. Rook d8 takes to f8 takes f3, and I'll grab this pawn on e5 as compensation. 
I thought this was crucial, uh, the main line. Queen A3 struck me as somehow fundamentally wrong that the queen on A3 really does not have a say in the game. And on G8, although it looks a little defensive, it also has uh, offensive purposes. After this uh, situation, I think Kamsky played absolutely flawless game from here on out, like uh, Hikaru essentially after this move has no chance. Check. King moved to d8, bishop here. So the first, the first problem emerges, oh dear, <laughs> what are we going to do about this pawn on e6? And if that pawn falls, that king on d8 is going to be next. Uh, stick the queen back on g8 for a moment, well, at least you wouldn't be uh, facing those issues. Uh, now Hikaru was, you know, in full uh, mode of trying to save the game. He played rook f8, bishop takes e6, and rook takes f3. This is a, you know, a lot of people, you know, in these open Sicilians, they understand the rook c8, Rook takes c3, exchange sacrifices, right? But if you play through about the 6,000 or so Victor Korchnoi games where he plays the French defense, I would say in a good percentage of them, he's sacrificing a rook uh, 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 against f3. In this case, not only was it forced, um, well, it's just the only way of gaining any play Otherwise, uh, the collapse of the d5 pawn and the exposed black's king, it would be over. Takes, queen takes f3, knight g3. Now, it's funny, and I hate it, <laughs> actually. Uh, the computers here, I think everybody, Ben, I think you'd agree, you'd, play, you'd slap down knight g3 in a blitz game with a hardly a second thought. I mean, it's just the, it's the ultimate human move. The knight's attacked, your king's a little exposed, your knight in front of your king, no more per perpetual checks, nothing to worry about. But the computers point out that in fact, and in fact they are right, that the move rook b1 is simply the best move. Uh, the idea behind rook b1 is that after queen takes e2, why give up your knight? Well, after rook takes b7, mm, there's just not a lot of joy in Mudville over here, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, you know, white's just crashing through, and it's really that simple. And if we go back just a quick second, of course, Black would like to play king to c7, but then after bishop takes, king takes, rook takes, b7 resigns. And after a move like, for example, b5 now, well, it's very clear and easy to see that, well, with this knight hanging on c6, you're not very happy. And if you could get black to play rook b8, which he probably should do, then knight g3 is an automatic. But the inclusion of the moves rook b1 and rook b8 are very favorable for the first player. Excuse me, we'll go back. Here, knight g3 played, knight takes, rook here. And now again, his king, in order to save his king, queen f6 was, was necessary. And uh, uh, going into an ending, got as an exchange up. But again, this guy Hikaru, man, he's so resourceful. He comes up with, with tricks from really desperate positions. And we have to give God a credit because he just, n he allows uh, a lot of squirming, but no, uh, no, no saving, so to speak. So he's an exchange ahead. His rooks may not be beautiful or boastful at the moment, but the other problem, more concretely, the problem for black, is he hasn't solved his king. 
Bishop b5, attacking the rook. Rook d1, very nicely, threatening a, a discover check, picking up the rook. There's no time for bishop takes f1. King c7, check, and rook d1. Knight dropped back to c6. Bishop dropped back to e4, very nicely opening up uh, the gate, so to speak. And rook b8, rook b1, idea of a4. Here, king g2. Now here, I, again, I think that uh, Hikaru is lost. Yes, I mean, he's an exchange down. But I really don't like uh, what happened here. This bishop uh, going back to, well, h8. I don't say that he's going to save the game. But sometimes desperate measure, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. In a sense, black's losing, obviously black's losing the game, but why not try to put as much pressure on black as possible? And in this case, I mean, there was idea of at least king a4, king a3, or even some cases to play knight here and knight takes, offering to trade this one for this one. So bishop h8, mm, I didn't get high marks from me. Rook h7, a3, and now rook takes. Okay, if black had, <laughs> obviously, if black had had that extra move, king a4, he'd be doing reasonably. Knight e, uh, knight e4, king takes, knight c5. Here, I thought that uh, Gata played really, really well. Bishop takes a6. So the idea here is that, while well, it appears bishop takes a6, wins a piece, white has the nice little trick. Again, remember when I criticized the move bishop h8? Well, it just happens now that the bishop is on h8, white could play rook b8. Both black bishops are on pre. White's going to win back his piece, and then it's just going to be an exchange and two pawns versus a minor piece and pawn. An easy win for white. <coughs> Hikaru tried check. King g1 here. Some more moves. And here, uh, essentially what uh, Gada is doing is consolidating, just making sure his king is very safe uh, and winning pawns. King, knight, knight check, rook, rook, knight e5, h4, and here Hikaru resigned. So in a really powerful performance by Gata, I'm just not even sure he made any mistakes at all. I mean, his play, uh, once he got into the technical stages, his play was superb from the opening right through the middle game. His play made a, a really, really, really powerful impression. And I don't want to harp on uh, this one victory from Gata. Uh, Hikaru's not in the best of form. Uh, he's played a lot and played very successfully. Um, but uh, in this tournament, it's what's he, what's he doing at the moment, Ben? He's minus two. Mm -hmm.